So this is my studio. I use a glass palette that I found actually in the trash, but it's a coffee table top. My computer is located on a shelf. And what I do is I collect images off of the internet, like Tumblr and things like that. Then generally what I like to do is I like to flip the image and use a grid. Uh, and I've made some templates for that and use grid and transfer to make the painting from that and I crop it down to what I think is the essence of the image. So what I paint on is a bulletin board with uh, canvas panels that I have mounted to the board using strips of cardboard with pins to hold the edges and that way I can paint up to the very edge of the canvas panel. And I get my canvas panels at Dick Blick. Here are the colors I'm going to use for this painting, but I suggest that if you want to, you know, use a palette of my colors, you should pause the video and look at it. However, I need to point out that the colors that I'm using are colors that a lot of my students left behind in the classroom and I just sort of collected. I generally use Alkid Pro from CAS as my preferred paint, and I buy these large containers of the white which you have to seal up very tightly. So I use a piece of plastic from the canvas panels and I sort of pack it in there tightly and make sure that it's sealed very tightly. And that way the alkyd lasts a lot longer. <clears throat> now I'm gonna put the grid down and I just generally do this in burnt umber using uh, just my eyeball to do a series of half marks and things like that. And what I like to do with the image is I like to distort it or stylize it. And so, for instance, I think that the neck was too thin and long in the original reference material. And also the shoulders and arms weren't big enough. So the arm in the foreground, I raised the shoulder a little bit and made the arm a little bit bulkier. And also the arm in the background, to compensate for some of the foreshortening in the camera, I actually made that a little thicker as well. So what I probably should do is drop in a picture here. I don't use a lot of medium when I'm painting. Sometimes if I want to thin it a little bit, I'll add a little bit of the odorless terpenoid that I use to clean the brushes. But in general, what I use is a, a large 20 uh, Dick Blick bristle brush that's a bright. And that's the kind of brush I use. And I don't have to use a lot of medium to make it flow. And this is how I clean the brush. I just basically dunk it and uh, clean it on a sweat sock or a rag or something like that. Here's the panel. <clears throat> and the uh, first step that I'm going to do is I'm going to take some Payne's Gray that is a Windsor Newton Payne's Gray that I thought was really not a good color. So one of my students left it behind. So I'm mixing it with some of the Alkid and I'm going to use it as what's called dead coloring for the background. And it's just a way of getting some value structure established because I don't like, like to paint directly on a white background. And it also sets the edges off a little bit and allows me to see the drawing a little bit more clearly in terms of what I'm working on. So I'm using the largest brush I can, and then I pull some of that dead coloring, some of that Payne's Gray, into the rest of the painting. Here I am cleaning the brush again. Notice I'm just dunking it and then wiping it off, and it becomes really clean. Now, the flesh color that I usually block in is, a lot of times it's just some form of orange. In this case, it's Dick Blick portrait pink because I had a lot of that left over, so I'm using it as a body color. And I mixed in a little bit of cadmium orange light that was an Alkid paint from CAS Paints. And I'm just blocking in more or less the dead coloring, and I'm allowing some of the burnt umber that I used to block in the drawing and some of the Payne's Gray to lift up into the paint. you can see it, it's already creating some color variations and tonal variations, and I'm establishing the big values here.
this is the next step. And what that is, is I just added a little bit of a uh, iron oxide black that has a sort of purplish pink quality to it, mixed it in with the burnt umber. And I'm reestablishing some of the value structure and blending in. Now, this painting took me about nine hours to do, and I've reduced the video to about a half hour. So you're getting a sense of it being worked on very quickly. And I start the underpainting mainly with Alkid white. Uh, I also use Dick Blick soft white, mixing white for the, the thicker areas. But now that I'm establishing in some of the lighter areas, what I'm using for that is just some uh, of that CAS Alkid white mixed in with CAS Alkid uh, cadmium orange, which actually has some real cadmium in it, which makes it a little dangerous. Um, and I'm just putting in the big values. And by the time this painting is finished, I'll have probably about seven or eight layers of paint on it because what I try to do is build the paint up as quickly as possible to make sure that I have almost like the, uh, the paint is a, a cognate or, or similar to a layer that feels like skin. In this instance here, you can see that um, actually I mixed in a little bit of uh, burnt sienna in with the mixture of iron oxide black and burnt umber to make it a little bit more orange and i'm working on some of the middle tones and some of the middle values um, i generally use the largest brush i can and so for the first part of the painting i use a 20 uh, dick blick and now i'm switching to a number 16 bristle uh, dick blick brush and you can see it's about half the size of that 20. And I'm still trying to get as much paint on there as I possibly can. And the nice thing about using the Alkids is that they dry very, very quickly and they tack up really fast so that by the end of the painting, what I do is I switch to that soft mixing white paint. And the soft mixing white that I use actually is a lot bulkier and heavier and creates a sort of pastier, thicker paint on top. Artists call this impostos, and uh, basically what it is is I'm trying to get the texture to build up a little bit more alongside of the color, and there's a lot of variations that happen as you keep building a painting up. The other thing that um, you can't really see here because it's sped up almost 500 times is that the pressure that you put on the brush either thins the paint or allows it to be thick. So if you put a lot of pressure on, it generally tends to make the thinner areas, uh, which are the darker areas for me, thinner. And then I put a lot less pressure in the lighter areas and the highlights as a way to create a thicker paint film and make it feel like wherever the light is hitting, you'll see thicker impostos of paint or pastes of paint. And one of the things that helped me to learn how to do this was getting some videos by other artists. But the other thing that I really suggest you do is go to museums and art galleries and look at other artists' work and pay attention to the paint texture and the paint film. By the way, those ears are not real, <laughs> they're rubber. I just think that they're kind of funny because of the whole Van Gogh reference. You'll see on the left-hand side also, I have a broomstick and I use that broomstick to um, as a sort of paint stick and I lean it against the top of the edge of that um, cork board in order to steady my hand at certain points when I'm painting. Now I mixed in uh, more of that iron oxide with uh, the burnt umber and see I'm reestablishing in the darks there and reworking them in. And in this instance, I you don't it doesn't take a lot of the dark to darken that paint. One of the things that someone once said to me which I guess was a little insulting, was that I tend to mix a lot on the painting itself. And I guess that's true. And, you know, uh, one of the rules that I was taught is you're supposed to pre-mix on the palette. But you can see on the right-hand side there that I have a, a range of colors and tones that I'm working on. And I do count on the colors that are underneath to lift up into the top layers. And I also then go back in and reestablish tones. And I find that it gives a lot of variation of color in the paintings, and that's a big deal to me. I really want the colors to vary a lot. However, something really to think about is that value structure, shading, is more important in painting 
than actually color is. A lot of people think that color is really important. And there's actually scientific reasons for this. Your eyes are more sensitive to shading than they are to color. Uh, so one of the things that I suggest to students to not get caught up in is getting so worried about color that it becomes the end goal of the painting, unless the photo reference you work from is in color. And what I generally do is I convert almost all my photographic reference into black and white because digital photography lies about reds and oranges anyway, so I just sort of make it up as I go along. And uh, one of the most important things that I think you should think about is that color um, for flesh tones is usually orange. And so you see how I'm mixing the alkyd thin white with the cadmium orange, and I'm just putting in the, the brighter highlights. What I'm gonna do later on is actually uh, mix thicker layers, and I'll actually grab some of the Dick Blick portrait pink and mix that with the soft mixing white from the Dick Blick company, and that'll also make much thicker paint. So please forgive the fuzzy quality of this next section. I'm still trying to figure out my cameras and I'm working on it. What I wanted to show you next was how to mix colors up. And I also wanted to show you how to clean up some of the tools that I use. So I took some old grubby um, plastering knives that I use. And I'm showing you how easy it is to scrape paint up with those plastering knives. They're only a buck and a half each. Now, the next thing I do is I have a box with razor blades and pins in it. <clears throat> it's in a cardboard box or a cigar box. And I use the razor blades to get the rest of the paint off the blade. In general, I try to scrape away from myself because I've cut myself so many times. Every once in a while, I mess up and do it towards myself and cut myself. So I would suggest you try to get into the habit. And so I'm just taking off all the old grubby paint. And I'll also use those knives to take the rest of the paint off of the glass plate there, and then I'm going to show you how to mix paint up using those two knives, which is basically almost like what I'm doing here when I'm cleaning up the mess from the earlier part of the painting. What I what I do is I make a ball on it. I slide the, the knives and I make this sort of uh, ball of pigment, and I learned how to do this when I was actually plastering walls uh, when I was a kid. I used to do construction work. Old sweat socks are the bomb as rags because they soak up so much stuff and then you can cut them open and then use the inside. So I'm using that to, to get the rest. And then I take a razor blade uh, and I am scraping towards myself, but it's not uh, really dried on paint. So it's not as dangerous as, <laughs> as usual. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you, I'm going to mix up a color for the background. And on the far right hand side on the palette, you'll see that I have a really bright blue, uh, a little schmegel of uh, dried paint got in there and I was taking that off. And I'm using the Dick Blick Soft Mixing White and some of that Alkyd Ocean Blue paint, which almost looks uh, like a purple to me in some ways. It almost leans towards the red. And see how I'm sort of running it off of the edges of the knives and then smearing it down onto the glass panel and scraping it back up. That ensures that it's going to become a fairly thick, permanent, uh, evenly mixed layer of paint. Then you can actually throw it down on there, take a little bit. And what I'm doing is I'm making a small ball uh, on the edge of the knife and I'm going to use it to literally plaster it onto the painting that's on the palette there or the the easel there and then i'll go back in later once i have it laid on and i plan on smoothing it out and fixing up the texture so you can see also how I get to the edges of things by having the cardboard hold the panel there. And now I'm mixing in the old uh, Payne's gray that I used for the background with it just to have a little bit of that leftover because I know that that's how it's going to look once I use my number 20 bristle brush to smooth it all in. Toilet paper is really good for getting old paint off and I have in my studio one of those uh, bathroom trash cans that have a push pedal on it because the fumes from this alkyd and stuff get really, really strong. So I suggest you clean up every day and take your trash out every day. And here I am cleaning up a little bit more of the old paint uh, now that I have the background. And it's going to change how I think about 
and how I color the foreground, the figures. So look how much paint I squeeze out. I use up so much paint on a painting. And that's that uh, soft mixing white that I mentioned earlier. Now, because I have so much on there, see how nice that texture is? And part of what is also happening is because I'm using this, alkyds dry super fast, uh, and they also tend to be really brilliant in their color. What's going to be nice is the paint will actually sort of tack up or dry really quickly in the background. And over the course of the uh, eight or nine hours that I'm working on this painting, it's going to become, it's going to firm up and it won't pick up as much. See how that changed the whole value structure of the painting? It just, and also the alkyd color is so much more brilliant than the Payne's gray, which was supposed to be blue and uh, black and white, but it was a very dead looking color. And lately I've been kind of wanting to work with brilliant color. So in this instance here, that's what I'm doing. I've cleaned my brush. By the way, that uh, paint tray on the right hand side there, I use that to hold my brushes in and I have walnut oil in the tray and that way I don't have to clean my brushes at the end of the day. And I just let them soak overnight in, the, in this walnut oil, which is a little expensive, but it saves on the brushes. The brushes last longer. I'm taking the soft mixing white and mixing it with cadmium orange for the high tones because that alkyd cadmium orange is so bright, it's gonna be able to compete with that really brilliant blue in the background. See, it's so pretty. Now that orange that I'm using, I think it leans a little bit towards the yellow. Um, you know, it's it's all really subtle and, and probably has to do with how you see color and how I see color and that kind of thing. But in this instance, what I'm doing is I'm mixing it in on top of the sort of deader colors that use that portrait pink and have some of the grays and some of the browns in them. And it really beefs it up. It activates it. It mixes in with the burnt sienna, which makes it, uh, it leans it towards the orange, uh, the red orange. And eventually what I'm going to do is I'm going to surround that cadmium orange highlight with uh, cadmium red light and soft mixing white to give some pink variations. So there'll be pink variations between the high orange, which is a lighter value, and it'll provide one more sort of step of variation in color in there. See how I'm like kind of leaving thick paint on there and I'm using that number 20 brush. I really like to build it up super, super thick. It's kind of one of the things that I think a painting should be is almost sculptural. Now I'm going to take some of that soft mixing white and the cadmium uh, red light, the pink, and I'm using a number eight brush, which is a very small one because I want to get into the face a little bit and some of the pinks in the cheeks. So this is how facial color generally tends to work. Around the nose and cheeks, I use a little bit of cadmium red light mixed with white to make a sort of pink. Uh, and I also do that to surround the cadmium orange. And you can see what the colors I have mixed up here are. The undercoating, which is burnt sienna, portrait pink, and soft mixing white. And then it goes into the cadmium orange and white, and then the cadmium red light. See how that, um, that pink just activates all the other colors by the contrast of it? Uh, sorry that that stick is in the way. It's actually a broomstick that I use as a painting stick to brace my hand. And you'll see how I kind of lean against it and it leans against the wall and against the edge of the drafting uh, or the, the bulletin board that I use as my easel, which is just basically mounted to the wall. Saves a lot of floor space. That's reestablishing some of the darks. And I think what I picked up there was uh, burnt sienna and burnt orange or uh, burnt umber and see how it's a little grayer, even though it's a brown and is a sort of red orange in comparison to all the warm colors of the pinks and the yellow oranges, it reads a little bit more gray. And so in terms of also the face for a male figure, uh, the beard line tends to look bluer or grayer 
than the cheeks. And one of the other things that some artists like to do for the forehead is make that a little bit more yellow. I, I generally tend to just make it more pale when I get to the, for, the forehead. But I think that there's a, even though I'm talking about color because I love it so much, there's an overemphasis on it. I think that if all you did was make this painting in um, orange and brown and you got the values right, people would be totally into it. And I think that color really is for painters to look at and that most normal mortals just look at a painting in terms of the shading and value structure unless color is the subject of the painting. So, for example, if you have a photograph that has, uh, you know, uh, purple shadows and, and orange and pink highlights, almost like lighting on a stage, then, of course, you're going to really want to emphasize that more. But this is a very even toned kind of painting, even though there's a lot of value structure. Uh, the light is probably coming from just in front of the figure on the upper left hand side and then drops back on the right. I think value structure is much more important than color, even though that's what I've been basically talking about. And so if you're a beginning painter, you may even want to just do 15 or 20 paintings in black and white till you learn how to control blending and paint. That's what I did when I started. I just did paintings in black and white. And then if I wanted to colorize them, I'd actually use thin layers of what's called liquid to lay on top of the color in transparent layers. In this next section, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on the background a little bit more, and then I'll return to the foreground. And what I've been enjoying doing is putting patterns into the background. I actually looked up on the internet how to make repeating patterns, and then I obsessively drew them in my sketchbook and even do them on envelopes that I send off to people. Here I am sort of counting off the units and trying to figure out uh, where the next dot should go so that it makes sense in reference to the figure. And what I do to establish the pattern is I start with a series of circles or dots uh, that I etch into the paint with a pencil. And you can see because the paint's so thick, it looks really cool. And what I'll eventually do is etch in a sort of floral design in the background. And I'll try to use colors that are similar to the colors that I'm using in the figure. Lately, what I've been doing is using uh, this Alkid house paint, which is really brilliant in color and flows on really thick. And I put it on with a, um, a brush that's uh, a sable brush that will float on top. And see how I just start by, you start with the pattern and then you just keep obsessively <laughs> Uh, redoing the same pattern in other areas. And, you know, I rehearsed all of this first by doing tons of drawings of patterns till I get it. And of course, I use that broom handle to support my arm so that I don't have to rest my finger on the painting because I've smeared more paintings doing that. And what I'll do is once I get that pattern sort of etched in, those, those etched lines will disappear. Now, this is Basically, what I'm using is I went out, and since I live in California, you're not allowed to do this too much, but I bought old oil alkyd paint, and I put it into small jars because this stuff dries super fast, and it's super brilliant and permanent in color. Then I pour it onto the palette. And it makes these puddles that I'll have to clean up later. So at the end of the video, I'll show you how I clean up. And I use a soft um, red sable brush to float the color back on. In this instance, I think it's actually a number eight, the same size as the bristle that I use. And unfortunately, these are called Master Stroke. Uh, Dick Blick has stopped making them. I have a little back supply of them, but they were super cheap. And now I have to buy more expensive ones when I when these get destroyed or used up. And you can see, like I just dip it into the puddle of paint. You can't get it too wet because then it'll run down as, as droplets. Uh, I'm actually thinking about laying the painting flat uh, next time I do this because I'm starting to really get the hang, hang of it. But see how I'm putting the patterns into the etched lines into the drawing that I made on there already. So here's something to think about. If you mess up, it doesn't matter because you can take those scrapers and just scrape all the paint off and put the background back on again. So and it'll probably only make the painting a little richer. So don't panic if you're putting a background in that kind of sucks. You can fix it. 
Um, now, once I put it that orange on there, it, I don't, well, you know, because it's a film, you can't see it as well. Uh, digital photography is not really good with yellows and uh, reds. Well, actually reds and oranges. What I'm going to do later on is readjust the color because I think that it really changed the color temperature. The other thing is I put um, other sort of patterns in by using, mixing some white alkyd in with the orange and making a sort of lighter petal. And eventually what I'll do is I'm going to go back in and probably retouch a lot of those patterns that I did so that they are more firmly established uh, and that the paint is floating on top. So it's almost like, again, in the background, you have to do two or three layers sometimes as many as four or five layers to get the effect you want. And remember this painting took me about nine hours and I totally rushed through it so that it would all fit in one day and on one video. Uh, you know, I'm just experimenting with making videos here so that I can teach people how to do this stuff. So one of the problems that I had here, see these little uh, sort of flower petals that are a pale uh, light blue. They're not, bright enough for me. So later on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to brighten them up by adding white in with them. And I'll repaint most of those petals again. See how I mixed up a thicker layer of that white. And then I thought, oh, that looks really cool. I think I'm going to redo all the petals in the background to reestablish that. As I'm recording this, the heat went on in my house, so you may hear a little bit of a buzz, sorry. See how I'm, I'm repainting <laughs> those things I already painted before? I think it looks a lot better now that I... And, and if you think about it, that's really about value structure. It's not about color. It's really about light and dark. And I think that so many painters get so wrapped up in color, including myself, and they think that that works. Now, this is me fixing... Uh, amping up the oranges in the flesh tones, and then I'll have to go back in and amp up some of the pinks as well. But see how it looks a little bit better in comparison to the other orange in the background? I didn't use, uh, I have in the past used some of that house paint in with the regular paint because it mixes fine, it's oil-based. But in this instance here, I'm sort of just reestablishing, see the pinks, how much, it's almost like raising the volume on something or adding more salt sugar to a dish when you're cooking so that it compensates and gives you more high and low points. It's the spice that happens. And I think this looks immensely better once I retouch the background. Now, in the uh, last section here that you see, I mixed some of that soft mixing white with a little bit of uh, the portrait pink because I wanted it to feel opaque like it feels when light is is actually bouncing off of the surface of skin because highlights are really light bouncing back. It it's, has no qualities of what's really underneath it. Uh, a lot of times it's just a highlight. And so that's the thickest paint on here. And honestly, I didn't expect to want to or have to go back in and reestablish these highlights at the end of the painting. But I guess after you've painted enough, you realize, oh, I need to add more of that stuff to it. Um, so at the very last stage that you see here is I've picked up that uh, soft sable number eight brush uh, that's called a master stroke brush. Uh, someone must have thought this was pretty funny because it's called Dick Blick master stroke. But, <laughs> and I'm actually floating some of the highlights onto the top there and trying to establish um, a little bit more of the slight variations that float in on top, some of the reflected lights in the darks there, and work things out. So it's kind of hard to know when to stop. And um, so generally what I've been doing is I stop kind of short of... It. I always think that there's a little bit more I can do, but I've taken paintings too far and then they look stiff and sort of picked over or worked over. And I'd rather have them look fresh and a little unfinished at this point in my career. So uh, what I'll do is I'll probably stop 
working on this in a moment. And um, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, and, you know, you can't really tell exactly what it looks like, but I'm happy with the painting. And the next thing I'm going to do is show you how to clean up your palette for the next day. Um, and I think that's kind of important is actually keeping things clean. And I plan on doing some uh, tapes on how to wash your brushes. But in this case, I have a small tray that's used actually for, for paint. <laughs> I'm signing it. And the way I sign it is I actually use a pencil and just etch my initials in there and then the date. And uh, I just leave the brushes soaking in walnut oil uh, until I paint the next time. So I'm going to show you how to clean up now. So in this section, I want to show you how to clean up. And basically what I do is I use my paper cutter and cut up old boxes. And I use sheets of cardboard to uh, basically scrape the paint off and then scoop it and throw it into a trash can that I have located right underneath the palette there. And I use it the same way I use the painting knives to get the paint into balls and just clean it off. And then I'll go back in with my painting knives and get the rest of it off of there. And uh, the Alkid white doesn't really last uh, as well as I would like overnight. Sometimes I do save it and I uh, will use it to texturize or mix up a big batch of color and then I'll wrap it up in plastic and use it the next day. Um, and there I, I am going to do that there. <laughs> um, and then the next thing I do is I use these sheets of uh, plastic that I get from the canvas panels, or I use saran wrap and I rip off sheets and I put it on top of the paint piles that I have there. And you can see it's it's really soupy and goopy. So I know that's going to last until I can paint the next day, you know, because I plan on painting tomorrow. But which I did, <laughs> uh, clean it off with some toilet paper or with some rags, take a razor blade and clean up the rest of that stuff that's sitting there on the palette sometimes because that's a little messy. Uh, and uh, then just use the plastic wrap to uh, seal everything off. I think it's a little easier if you wipe things off first with uh, toilet paper and get rid of the big piles of it. Um, uh, you know, so generally what I do is I keep a roll of uh, toilet paper in the studio. Uh, it's a lot less expensive than paper towels. Also, I go to thrift stores and I collect old socks and T-shirts, the, the really ugly cheap ones. Or I just take the socks that Elastic has come out of or whatever and use those. And um, then this is, it's really nice thick plastic. It's better than saran wrap and it's easier to use because saran wrap sticks to itself. And I just use those sheets of, of plastic that I've cut off the back of the panels. And if you squeeze uh, the little blobs of paint around it, it generally tends to keep it sealed until the next time. I've left paint sealed like this for as long as a week or two when I was teaching full time and I couldn't get back into the studio every day like I wanted to and been able to come in, lift that stuff off, throw the saran wrap away and it works. So that's how I make a painting.